I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers. And we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. If the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. Do you believe your greatest days are ahead of you? Do you believe you could do more, be more? Do you believe that God could use you? Let hope light the way. You're going to have to train to compete. It's going to take discipline. It's going to take diligence. It's going to take perseverance. Run the race set before you. You're going to have to train to compete, and you're going to have to compete to win the prize. You might mess up. You might fall down, but God is training you for a comeback. The greatest potential for who God is calling you to be depends on the decisions you are making right now. Step into the ring. Rush onto the field. Sprint towards the finish line with victory in your sights. Go for the goal. Finish as a champion. Let the games begin. God is calling you to be a spiritual Olympian. Uh, I'm so excited that you're gathered with us today. And uh, I want to welcome all of you who are watching online as a part of Victory Everywhere, like Jeff Paris and his family who are watching out there from Myrtle Beach right now in this moment. I uh, also want to take a second uh, to, to welcome uh, our first time, they receive a first time t-shirt, Shelby Norzer from Indianapolis. She uh, logged in last week and showed up. And I, I'm just saying, if you're in this room in this moment, you came on the perfect Sunday. If you logged in, you came on the perfect Sunday because we're starting a brand new series, which means you missed nothing. Like you're starting over uh, with us and so you haven't missed anything. And, and, and for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, the, the Olympics because the world is, is watching uh, the, the, the Olympics in Tokyo. And so we thought we'd spend some time uh, looking at how our faith intersects our life and intersects the Olympics. And so uh, as we admire the ability that God has given these athletes who are in peak physical condition, I just thought, what would it look like for us to examine peak spiritual condition? What would that look like? So uh, when we, uh, and I want to remind us as we're thinking about that, that when we uh, place our life underneath biblical authority, it's a better way to do life. Like we're called to, to place our life underneath biblical authority because it's a better way to do life. Notice I didn't say easier, but I promise you it is better. It's, it's a better way. And so, um, in, in fact, this is interesting. You might not know this. Uh, but even if you don't believe everything initially, you know, it means you could come to this moment skeptical about the whole thing. But the minute you, you try it, you, know, you will see for yourself, experience for yourself, how living underneath biblical authority is, is a better way to do life. In fact, that's what Missy uh, from Spencer told me about a month ago. We were talking and uh, she travels sometimes from Spencer, other time watches this online. But she told me she's had a rough year. Um, but she's placed her life underneath biblical authority in her life, not necessarily easier, but it's, it's better. And, and that can work for you too. You could be a better husband, a better friend, a better spouse, a better employee, a better parent. You could be better equipped to deal with the difficult things that you and I face in our everyday life. And that's why this is one of our values, because it, it works. It's true. 
And so today, uh, we come to learn from how God's word intersects with our lives and our faith. As we, and as we kick off this series on Olympian, I just thought I'd do a quick survey. How, how many of you, just I know, to know what I'm dealing with, how many of you, by show of hands or an emoji, if you're watching online, just be careful which hand emoji you give us, right? <laughs> Uh, how many of you watched the opening ceremonies Friday? Anybody watch the, okay, a few of us. Yeah, I, okay. I, how many of you watch uh, as much Olympic coverage as possible? Like you love everything. You love race walking, handball, uh, badminton, trampolining. You're jumping on it. You're in. Anybody? And, and I, I love, I watch, it's on all the time for me. Uh, how many of you are just into the books, big sports like football? Anybody? Football or Katie Ledecky, um, uh, Simone Biles and Caleb, uh, <clears throat> Dressel swimming. Uh, anybody? That, that's you? Okay. Cool. How about last one? How many of you like are history buffs about when you think about the Olympics, you think about like how it impacted history? Uh, anybody like that? Just okay. A couple of us, right? Right. Well, I mean, if, if that's you, then you probably know this, that the Tokyo Olympics are the 29th Olympic Games in which the United States has participated in. And the very first American to capture Olympic gold was this man right here. His name is James Connolly. And he won the triple jump in 1896 in Athens. That, that's pretty incredible. And which is amazing is because this whole thing began in Greece and Olympia, uh, around Olympia, Greece in 776 BC. So roughly 776 years before Jesus was born, the Olympics competition began. Now, unlike uh, today's Olympic Games, way, way, way back then, the, the Olympic Games began as, get this, a religious ceremony. Isn't that interesting? They began then as a religious ceremony, and it originated in Greece. Now, if you were to read your Bible, uh, and, and then you were to go ahead and read the secular historian Josephus, uh, you, you would find that in, in your Bible, one of, the, one of the famous people in the Bible uh, actually helped save the Olympics. Now, isn't that pretty amazing? Like, he, he ended up saving the Olympics. Now, when you open up your Bible, you're going to find this is interesting because he's not a good guy in the Bible. He, he's not. In fact, he's the villain of the Christmas account, but his name is Herod the Great. That, that's who ended up saving uh, the, the Olympics way back then. And so that, that means that the Bible's not once upon a time, right? The Bible records history and events of people who actually live. So, so one of the people that we read about in the New Testament uh, was saved the Olympics in around 12 B.C. So, so Herod was in his 60s and he made his third and final journey over to Rome to report to Caesar because Israel was controlled by Rome. And on his way to Rome, he stopped in to partake in the 192nd Olympic Games. Now on his trip, Josephus, the secular historian, he informs us that when Herod arrived, he found the Olympics were not what he thought they should be. Like not what they once were. The, the sites uh, where the Olympics were held, they needed reconstructed and renovated. There was no opening ceremony. There were no victor statues. There were no sacrifices, no banquets. And so Herod comes on the scene and Josephus writes this. They, so they have nothing, they have, uh, they have come to nothing. He only remains of ancient Greece. Like they were in a manner gone. And so Herod rolls in and the games are nothing like they thought he, they, they were, nothing like what he had imagined. And they were in desperate, desperate need of money. And so Josephus records that Herod donated so much money that not only the people of Greece would, would know about it, but all the habitable earth would know about it. As far as the glory of the Olympic games has reached, they're, they're going to know about that, the money that he donated. I just I don't know about you. That's a lot of money. That, that's a ton of money. And just to give you an idea, the Tokyo uh, Olympics uh, this year uh, it took, cost them $26 billion to host the Olympic Games. That's a whole lot of lettuce, right? So, so now in terms of for his generosity, Herod was going to be proclaimed president of the Olympic Games for life. And so after Herod returned home around 9 BC, he, he went to Caesarea Maritime all the way over here, and over here by the Mediterranean Sea. And he introduced the Olympic Games to this area in an unprecedented level. He, he constructed this area right here. It's, it's called Herod's Hippodome, right? He, he was known uh, for the theater, the arena. Uh, and, and so this was just where he, the, they, with athletes, would train. 
And these, these games were going to take place here in these buildings. And this was so big and so massive and so well done that you could see the remnants still here today. So way back in 9 BC, Herod began to inaugurate this city. And this is what the historians record. With great pomp and splendor, which included musical contests. Can you imagine that at the Olympics? Athletic exercises, horse trading, and fights by gladiators with wild beasts. I, can you just imagine this week you see gladiators fighting wild beasts? I'm telling you, that is much must-see TV. You, you got me hooked on that. I, I'm watching that. So the Olympic Games and the Olympic themes are so common in, in the Bible. And even though all of that information I share with you is outside of the Bible, it, it's, it's history. And it helps us to better understand the biblical message because the Bible connects with real life. And, and you can uh, read in your Bible this guy that we meet in the book of Acts, and he's well known for using these Olympic type themes. Now, themes. Now, if you're not a Christian, I'm telling you, this guy, he's probably your guy because he wasn't only not a Christian, he was anti Christian, right? And, and he comes on the scene as Christians know him as Paul, but his first name was Saul. And he was hostile towards Christianity. He, he thought all the Christians should be killed, right? So, so maybe you in agreement with him. I'm telling you, you should read about the Apostle Paul. And in Acts 9, Saul, who was Paul, meets Jesus. And Jesus, like he does with everyone, completely changes Saul's life. So he goes from becoming Saul to changing his name to becoming Paul. And he goes from being anti-Christian to becoming someone who spends the rest of his life telling everyone about the life-changing message of Jesus. And so Paul plants all these churches all over the Mediterranean rim. All these little dots are churches that he planted. I'm telling you, this is history. These are facts. Even people who don't believe in the Bible, they believe the Apostle Paul did this. And that means simply this. And I think somebody needs to hear this. God can use anyone and everyone. Think of the worst person you can think about. God can use anyone and everyone. Hopefully they're not sitting next to you. God can use anyone and everyone. And God can use this one-time anti-Christian to proclaim to the world the life-changing love of Jesus. Now, the first Jesus followers, they were a part of, most people will call them the rough crowd. And Paul was rough. And Paul was thrown into prison for being a troublemaker. Uh, he got arrested because he was living out his faith. He got arrested because he told everybody there's only one way to heaven. He got arrested because he wouldn't be quiet about how Jesus had changed his life. He got arrested for telling people about Jesus. And Paul, get this, this is history. Paul was in prison where? Caesarea Philippi, or sorry, Caesarea Maritime for two years. Two years he was there. Now, if you were to go there to take a tour today, they would show you the place where they think Paul most likely spent his time in prison. And outside of his prison window, he would have seen this, Herod's Hippodome, where people would have been training for the Olympics. Now, when you take that knowledge... And you realize that the Apostle Paul, uh, why he, when he wrote, you realize why he used so many Olympic type metaphors in his letter. Now, as I prepared for this message in this series, I, I thought about just the difference between the, the, the athletes, the amazing Olympic, Olympic athletes, and, and the average everyday weekend warriors like, like you, right? So, so just on average, there's a difference between the daily calories, uh, between 1,800 and 2,000 calories for women, average weekend warrior, 2,400 to 2,800 calories for men, but for the Olympian, at 8,000 calories for women and 10,000 calories for men. And just so you know, it's not, not a whole bunch of Big Macs. Like, that's like legit food, you know, just kind of crazy to think about. Or, or the meals, the average weekend athlete, two to three meals a day, not so the Olympian, five to seven meals a day. You would probably get tired of eating. I, I just can't. Think about that. This is the calories that you would burn just sitting there. Two to 400 calories for the average person for the digestive system. All right, but for the Olympian, no, 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 2,000 calories. Could you imagine doing nothing and burning 2,000 calories, just your digestive system? The training for the average weekend, you know, warrior is one hour in a gym for three to five days a week, but the Olympian is six hours a day, six days a week, four hours a day, and six, day, six days a week in the off season. That's pretty amazing. In fact, in 2012, uh, the Olympics uh, was held and they observed that, that it took 10,000 hours for an Olympian to be trained for at least eight years to achieve elite performance. And what we find is simply this, the differences. The difference between the Olympian and the difference between me, and the difference in the Olympian and the difference between you, the difference is discipline. I mean, for the average weekend athlete, uh, you can get up and work out for an hour, but for the Olympian, it's a life's work leading up to one moment. 
Now, one of the letters that Apostle Paul writes, he writes to the church of Corinth and he leverages this metaphor. This is the difference maker for Jesus followers. So if you have your Bible or mobile device, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I, as you turn there, I just want you to think about this, that, that Corinth is, is in Greece, just 44 miles from Athens, where these, the Olympic Games are taking place. So Paul is writing to people and he's leveraging this metaphor to people who grew up watching others participate in the Olympics. Uh, and he writes this. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run. But how many? Only how many? One gets the prize. So the Apostle Paul, right there, he writes one of the most politically incorrect statements of this century. Like if you were to write this today, you would have had to have written something like this. Now don't you know that in a race, all the runners run and all of the runners get participation trophies and snacks. And then we had the Dairy Queen. Like that's, that's, in America today, like we don't tell our kids only one gets the prize. No, 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 no. Like you're special. You're a winner. We're all going to get trophies. Everybody's, no, but, but Paul says, no, no, no. Everybody's running. All run. But only one gets the prize. And then he leans in to tell the Jesus followers simply this. He says, you and I should run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, if you're new here, I have to reveal something about me. I messed up. You'll find that out, but I messed up. And I wish I could tell you that I always have my act together, that I always act with kindness and patience and peace. But here's what you would discover if you hung out with me. If we played cards or Candyland, you'd discover this. I hate to lose. I hate to, I'm not, I'm not proud of it. In fact, if, if, if I can't win, I won't play. I'll just give up. Like I, I, I hate to lose. I, and deep down, I believe in the great theologian, what Ricky Bobby said. If you ain't first, you're last. Like I, I believe that. And in fact, I never let my kids win. I, and it's total domination. When I'm playing a game with my kids, it's like, I want to make them pay. We had like a burrito game where you throw the burrito. I threw it at my son's face. Like it blew him up. Like I, I want to win. I know something's wrong with me. And, and you think, Josh, you should be nicer to your kids. No, 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 no. I want to win. I don't know what's wrong with me. In fact, the sickness, it's kind of a disease because... I compete with myself. Maybe you do this. You ever go to the grocery store and there's two lines about the same length and I stand in one line and imaginary me goes and stands in the other line and if imaginary me beats the real me, I lose my mind. I can't handle it. Like I start fidgeting. I mean, I'm in it to win it. I mean, how many of you are crazy like me? Anybody gonna admit that? A few of you are crazy like me. Yeah, so now even if you're not crazy like me, you probably have this in common. You'll tell your kids or grandkids, hey, just do your best. Like in sports or in work, just do your best. Go all in. I mean, put it out there on the field. So, so here's my question for all of us today. What if the people who follow Jesus said, it's time to be all in? What would, what would change? What, what if the people who follow Jesus said it's time to be all in. You see, the difference between me and the difference between you and the difference between like us and, and, and the people that we just admire for their faith, how much they know the Bible, how much faith they have is they went all in. And it just, if you just check Christianity out, like, just so you know, I'm not talking to you. I'm not trying to guilt you. You can belong here as long as it takes for, for you to believe. But, but just for the Jesus followers, what would it look like for you to go all in, to give it to your best shot. To say, I'm not just content with being an average weekend athlete. No, 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 I'm gonna run in such a way as to get the prize. I'm, I'm all in. Now, now listen, I, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying that when you go all in that you're never ever gonna sin anymore. I'm not saying that you never ever struggle anymore. But when it comes to following Jesus, we're not gonna be content with being an average weekend athlete. Now, someone takes the, the, the weekend approach. No, we're going to train and we're going to serve and we're going to run with discipline because we're, we're taking the Olympian approach. What, what would it look like for you? I mean, I'm talking to the people who say they follow Jesus, but, but if they had an honest moment, they'd say, I'm not giving it my best shot. Now, I'm not here to point any fingers at anybody, right? I, no one emailed me about you, just so you know. Like, I, I don't want you, honestly, I don't want you to feel any guilt. I want you to be inspired. Well, what could your life look like to go all in? What would happen if, if you said, okay, what would it take for me to be all in? I, I want to inspire you to see what God could do through you. And honestly, we, we need you. We're in desperate need for volunteers to use their gifts here. We need people who've been coming even for a few weeks to, to join some of our teams. And, and before you make the excuse that you don't have enough time, I get it, right? I, pause there. I'm not going to guilt you. I just want you to think about this. Think about how much better the church would be 
if every Jesus follower would be all in. Just, just think about it. Like, don't worry about your schedule. Just think about like, what, what, it, what, how much better would the world be if those who follow Jesus said, it's time for me to go on in. I, I'm not just gonna be content to run. I'm gonna run in such a way to win the prize. I, I am telling you, we would love better. We would serve better. We would care better. We would lead better. We would not have a bad name in, in the culture today if Jesus' followers said, I'm gonna go all in. I'm telling you, is that kind of love and that kind of devotion that changed the world once. It was. Think about this. Jesus took 11 guys who went all in and they changed the world. Now in Bible college, they didn't have math, right? But I'm looking around. It looks more, like an, more than 11 here, you know? I have to take off my shoes, but there's more than 11 people here. There's more than 11 people watching online. Just look, look, look at the person next to you and just say this. It's time to go all in. One, one, you can do it. One, two, three. Okay, you can, there you go. You can whisper it to yourself. It's time to go all in. We're, we're going to make this life a mission. We're, we're going to uh, make this life a, a life work. We're going to uh, leave it all out there on the field. Uh, and we're going to go all in. Now, now, just again, think about this. Next week is August. <laughs> you have September, October, November, December. A few short months. It's 2022. Think back at the beginning when you thought at the beginning of 2021, how, how much you were going to do in 2021, how awesome it was going to be. You just have a few short months. But what if you could say just a few months from now, you grew in your relationship with God? That 2021 was your best year. Right, what if you could say just a few months from now that you had a better marriage, that, that you had better relationships with your kids? What if you said just a few months from now that you, get this, you had more income? Wouldn't that be awesome, right? Just, just so you know, uh, we already, the church, someone generously paid this for the church for everyone to participate in the Dave Rancy financial course. And, and we just have a few months to complete it. But you can still do it in the time that you have left. What if, what if the only thing standing between you and a better way to do life was your decision to go all in, to give it everything you've got? I'm telling you, that invitation is open to anyone and everyone. No matter what you currently believe, no matter how badly you've behaved, the only way, but the only way that you can get there is discipline. The difference is discipline, to which you say, Josh, you should have come back with a better message. You've been gone too long to come at me with this, right? right? So, so Josh, don't you know that it's, I, th I think it's desire. Desire is what you should be preaching. Well, let me just tell you something about desire. You can desire something your whole life, but if you don't have the discipline to do it, you and I will die with desire. I hate to tell you, but the difference is discipline. I wish it wasn't true, but the difference is discipline. And Paul said, don't, don't be just content with running the race. No, he tells the Jesus followers, run in such a way as to get the what? Now, I want you to look at the last word first. He says, everyone who competes in these games goes into strict, what's that word? Training. If you have your Bible, underline that word. If it's in your mobile device, highlight that word. And, I, and I get this idea of training in your head because Paul says, everyone who competes in the games, he go, they go into strict training. And then he adds this, they do it, the people who train, the, the athletes do it to get a crown that will not last in other words, Paul informs us that the athletes, they're competing for something that won't last. And for example, the winner of the Summer Olympics of 2012 and 2016, do you know who it was? Good old USA. But last Friday, it did not matter who won the last two Olympics because that victory was temporary. And so Paul says, they do it to get a crown that will not last. Now, just think about this. The whole Olympian's life goes towards something that's temporary. Do you know what the, the shortest Olympic event recorded in history is? It took place around 1900, to, uh, 1900 and 1904. Uh, they, didn't, they don't have the event today, but it's the 60-meter race. See, all of the training, all of the sweat, all of the lifting, all of the sacrifice for one moment, and the event lasted for seven seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, done. Life is temporary. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it. All in, disciplined Jesus followers do it to get a crown that will last for how long? Forever. Life is temporary. Gold medals are temporary, but Jesus followers, we're called to train for what is eternal. 
And then he says, therefore, like meaning because of all of that, because, you know, he tells the Jesus followers, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. That's not how I do it. In other words, I have a plan in place for discipline in my life. He wants you to know he's leading the way and he's telling us the difference is discipline. So it's time to stop trying and start training. Just, just so we're clear, trying is different than training. Trying is, I'm going to do it when it's convenient for me. That's, that's trying. But training is simply this, I'm going to do it no matter what. I'm training towards it. it is, and so it's time to stop trying and start training. Now the biggest barrier to my growth and yours is something in our current cancel culture. It's producing this idea that, that, that we should expect this. We should expect perfection and progress at the exact same time. That if you don't do it perfectly, you're a hypocrite. If you don't respond the right way at the right time, you're a hypocrite. If you don't do the right thing in the exact sign, right moment, in the exact right way, you're canceled. You're done. Right? The culture expects perfection and progress at the exact same time. And when we fail, not if we fail, but when we fail, uh, when we're trying, that, the only options that leaves you and I is to be surrounded by hypocrisy, frustration, and failure. Those, those are our only options when we're just trying. That's what the world sees. He talks a big game, but did you see him? He failed again. The, the, we, when we're just trying, we're setting ourselves up to be a frustrated, failing hypocrite. But it's time to stop trying and time to start training because the world says we expect perfection and progress. But Jesus followers, here's what we need to do. We should expect progress towards perfection. Progress towards perfection. That we're growing in this. That we're training in this. We, we have to change our mindset, right? And so when we're training, we need to learn, eliminate, and practice. Learn, eliminate, and practice. Because if we're training, when we fail, we're not failures. No, we just get back up. Because we're training. That means there's areas we need to learn, eliminate, and practice in our life to get towards this goal. And when you do this, you're never stuck and you're never a hypocrite because you're in training. And this, this has nothing to do with self-help. This has everything to do with discipleship, which is a biblical word for spiritual training. And the difference, it's discipline. So it's time to stop trying. It's time to start training. And for the, what would it look like for the next few months to learn, eliminate, and practice areas of your life? Learn, eliminate, and practice. This, I mean, this could be a game changer for uh, you to tr troubleshoot shoot different areas. Because whenever you feel like a frustrated, failing hypocrite, you can just look at what do I need to add to my routine? What do I need to learn? Maybe what do I need to eliminate? What do I need to practice? Let me, let me just give you this illustration. Uh, what if I said today, after church, we're all going to go out and run a marathon as a church? I know what you'd say. I'm never coming back to that church again. I, just 26.2 miles, we're going to run this thing. We're going to do it together on your market set. Go. In about two hours, and you know what you'd find? Most of us dehydrated, passed out, and convulsing on the ground, right? And do you know why? Because we'd just be trying to run a marathon. Now, I know, I know, don't argue with me. There's some freaks in the audience that could actually run a marathon today, right? But here's the deal. If we train for six months and we had the right diet, we had the right exercise, we had the right training for six months, I would be willing to bet that an overwhelming majority of the audience could complete a marathon, and the only difference was we would have stopped trying and we started training. Now, we only have a few months left this year. It's time to start training. So, so let me just give you a few tips. Like maybe the very first thing you, you need to do to grow in your relationship with God is to actually read your Bible. And it's never been easier to read your Bible than it is today. We actually even have it on our app. You can download it on your phone. You can watch, read the Bible right there every day. Or you can go to iTunes, get this. They have the New Testament. You, they can read it to you. James Earl Jones can read you. Think about it. We live in a day where Darth Vader can read you the Bible. <laughs> you have no excuses. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who desire to get close to God. They will even pray for God's, God's will, but they refuse to participate in, in, in God's will. It's like praying and praying and praying. God, use me, use me, use me. But you never sign up to serve. Like, how can it happen? And I'm telling you, I, I promise you this. There will be days that you don't want to get out of bed. There will be days where you don't feel like participating. But guess what? You do it anyway. Because you're training. I mean, if the Olympians don't feel good or the weather's bad, what do you think they don't work out that day? No, they keep training. Because right? they're training and not trying. But the difference between the Olympians and the difference between the Christian that you want to be, the Jesus follower that you want to be, the difference is really discipline. 
Now, for some of you, uh, the next step for you is to, to fish, is to say, to become who you want to become is to be full, officially fully engaged. And here at Victory, that means an immersed believer participating in the four Gs, the gathering, the groups, the gifts, and generosity. That's, and for some of you, the very first step is, is baptism. And when you hear me say baptism, you think things like this. I've been meaning to do that. Well, I'm telling you, today is the day. Last week, we had 10 people get baptized. It's time for you to go all in. What, what, what are you, you waiting for? I know that we got another baptism scheduled after this service. You could be along with that. You could be in. It's time, it's time to start running this race. And for some of you, the, the very next step is to use your gifts. Right here by serving. Just, just so you know, we still need kids ministry volunteers, middle school ministry volunteers, high school volunteers, soccer and volleyball coaches and volunteers, people who play instruments, people who work in the broadcast area, people who host online. I mean, we need volunteers in the cafe. And we need people to really stop trying and start training and discipline. It just, it makes the difference. In fact, get this. If you want more money in your pockets by the end of the year, all you have to do is start using money God's way. Give some, save some, live on the rest. To which you might say, Josh, I tried tithing and it doesn't work. To which I'd say, exactly, you, you tried. I, you said, I'm going to do it until it's inconvenient. But training is, I'm going to do it no matter what. To which you might say, Josh, 10% sounds like a whole lot. I, I agree, it does. Don't start there, right? Use this chart that's in, that's in your notes. Like it's a reoccurring sacrificial percent. Here's your income. Here's the percent. Find, find a reoccurring sacrificial percent and start there. Uh, you can check that out later on this week. But, but it's time for us to start training. Now, now here, here's something interesting, because we'll ta stop talking about that. Here's something, if you go to NBC News, they had an article. There was one determining factor that would make you 95% successful in completing uh, your next workout. So, so this, is about spirit, this is about physical training. There's one factor, this is awesome, that would make you 95% success rate. I mean, can you imagine what this might be? Right, wake up early, you know, I don't know, eat more protein bars. No, it's one thing, guess, guess what it is? It simply says this. One study found that 95% of those who started a weightless pro pro program with friends completed the program. Basically, life is better connected. We train better together. We train better with a partner because a partner will push you and they will strengthen you to become a better version of yourself. And we have a group link uh, hosted on August 29th, so you can already make plans right now. Say, I want to be a part of that. And if you sense God moving in your heart to do any of these things, it's not because the sermon's really good. I realize it's not my best work. I'm just telling you, that's the Holy Spirit moving inside of you. Say, it's time for you to go all in. You need to be joining one of our groups. We need you on the serving team. You can see what God could do through you and pick a partner and run this race together. And it won't be easy, but the good things in life definitely never are. The difference is discipline. And I just want you to notice something. Paul does here. He finishes out this whole thing, and it's really, really interesting. He uses six personal pronouns to show us whose responsibility it is to live with discipline. So you can count on your own as I read, you. Now, read to you. Now, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Six personal pronouns in this verse. And what Paul's trying to communicate is simply this. Discipline is whose responsibility? My responsibility. It's my responsibility. Discipline is your responsibility. It's not your mama's. It's not your dad's. It's not your kids. Discipline is my responsibility. No one is going to do this for you. Get this. No one can do it for you. you, you, you so, so you have to say, you know what? It's not desire. It is Discipline. So as you and I watched the Olympics this week, uh, you know the thing that made the, them Olympians <laughs> is it's so much more than desire. The thing that made them Olympians is discipline. And if you struggle with discipline, I will simply admit to you, I, me too. I, I do all the time. But just because we struggle doesn't mean we should stop. No, we're training. So we need to learn, eliminate, and practice. Learn, eliminate, and practice. And in your training... You might pull a hammy, right? You might get wrong. You might get hurt. But just remember, God does some of his best work while we're hurting. Just because you're wounded doesn't mean you're worthless. So let's get up and let's run this race together. Now today, uh, we're going to close that just a little bit differently. I, I, as we close that, I'm going to pray. But I, I want you to all stand as we pray. So if you just stand up in this moment right now. And I just want this moment to be between you and God. There's nobody else looking at you in the room, but we're gonna bow our head and close our eyes in a minute. And if you feel like on your heart, God, it's time for me to go all in. 
I, I need to get some discipline in my life. It's time to stop trying and start training. I just want you to take just a baby step. Did you even see that? I didn't even, you can't even see it. I took a baby step. No one else around has to see it. But just between you and God. I said, God, I, 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 need to, I need to get into this. I need to give my life to you. I want to be who you want me to be. So let's just close, bow our heads and close our eyes and let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you for your example that you set for us. And I pray that every single one of us would step out in faith this week with not just a feeling, but knowing that you are with us as we go all in. And so as we watch the athletes compete this week, may we be reminded that the difference is the discipline. And you call us to discipline and development, to learn, eliminate, and practice. And so, Father, I just pray in this moment that if we accept your calling on our life, that we just take this baby step forward, saying, I, I want to give more of my life, devote more of my life, go all in to follow you. Father, we love you. We thank you that you give us a better way to do life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you made any decision, the, the next step room is the place for you. It's out the door and to the left, out the door and to the left. If you want to get baptized, you can join that one person today. It's out the door and to the left. If you're watching online, you can text 317-576-2288. We'll begin a conversation with you. And I hope you come back next week as we enjoy the rest of the series called Olympian. Have a great week.